Hello, everybody. How's it going? Thank you all for joining us today. We have an awesome presentation put together by our wonderful education ambassador, Lindsay Lofner, and an extremely special guest who I think a lot of you will be very excited to see. Our own Captain Brett is also here to lend some of his expertise. So thank you both for being here. Um, this week's class is brought um, to is uh, brought to you by our longtime partner, Yeti Coolers. They've been making awesome stuff for a long time, and they've been funding our work around the world. They've really been there since for not since for a very very long time, and we are so glad to have them as a partner. Um, there is, I do want to let everybody know before we get started that there is a question I see many of you using right now. Um, if you do have a question, please leave it there and. Um, I will try and get it to either Lindsay or Brett. The more on topic your question is, the better chance we'll have of actually getting it answered. If it's really important, um, I will interrupt them. Otherwise, we'll try to save the questions until the end. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it over to the excellent presentation that Lindsay has put together this week, uh, all about how we combine science and fishing and the man who makes it all happen, uh, Captain Brett himself. So Lindsay, with that, I think I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you everybody for joining us today. It is such an honor to be able to be here and talk to you about some of my favorite things that's going on at O-Search and that's talking with Captain Brett McBride about fishing and his techniques and his backgrounds and what he's doing to use his skills to give back to the science community, to education, and uh, to communities around the world that he's been to. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and dive in and get started. And Captain Brett, you have had so many wonderful experiences on the water. I wondered if you wouldn't mind sharing how you got started. Um, well, I've, I've talked to you about uh, when you started being on the water when you were really young, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I was very fortunate um, to get started at a very young age. I started fishing salt water. Actually, my parents took me out, I think, uh, when I was four or five years old um, mm -hmm. down in San Diego. And I got really lucky to um, – we just – um, We found a boat that uh, – um, happened to have just one of the pioneers of the industry in San Diego, and he was very good with kids, and he saw my passion at a young age, and that uh, my, my mom saw my passion, so she let me go and started taking me back out. Next thing you know, um, they were taking me out for free, and I was getting out of school, and, and I just, you know, I, I basically knew when I was about five years old that uh, I wanted to be just like the captain and crew of the boats that I was on, and that's what I wanted to do for my life, and I had never really changed my mind, and I just uh, followed my passion um, to wherever it led me. And I think that you know, having two parents um, as doctors, and having so many doctors and scientists in my extended family, um, it was a really natural fit for me when we started uh, working with scientists, and it made my mom and dad proud. So, which made it even better for me. Oh, that's excellent. I, I think I've also been really interested in how you've talked about you've been spearfishing and uh, different forms of fishing, too, uh, over the years, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty much grown up around the water. Um, I started, you know, fishing when I was five on the salt water. I started working on boats when I was uh, somewhere after sixth grade. I started working my summers and my weekends during the school, um, all the way through junior high school and high school. Um, I started spearfishing probably around sixth grade or so, um, you know, Hawaiian slang and in, in, in inshore waters, looking for bass and halibut and um, worked my way out to the, you know, I was living in La Jolla or living in San Diego and, and diving in La Jolla and surfing in La Jolla. Um, so it's a perfect, it's the, it's the, the birthplace of modern day spearfishing with uh, some of the, the pioneers that grew up there. So you know, the kelp forest and then offshore and so we have Mexico right below us. So, um, I was very blessed um, growing up to be able to spend my life so much of it in and on the water. And those experiences uh, led you to um, now being the fishing master uh, with O-Search. 
And I think, John, we can go ahead and cut to the video of the first shark that you guys ever tagged. Yeah, yeah, stand by here. There's a couple of people uh, who aren't seeing the video. I see a lot, half hour, half hour. I'm gonna give me one second here, and then we'll play the, the very first video, Garmin. But let me make one quick tweak here and see if that helps some, uh, some people. Okay. Hang on, everybody, stand by. Thank you for bearing with us while we fix this problem that it sounds like some people are having. Um, that's <laughs> I'm gonna just fix this for a second. Yeah, sorry guys. We so some people were having a problem <laughs> seeing the video and others are. So I just made a fix. Obviously, if I'm talking to you, you don't need the problem fixed, but uh, I just left a message in the comment. So like like uh, you just said, Lindsay, um, and Brett, you just said, you grew up on the water um, fishing and, you know, everything. But then you were presented with a problem when OSEARCH started of, of catching a giant white shark and getting scientists safe access to it that... And this is really a problem that nobody had ever really tried to solve before. So let's take a look at that first white shark that you ever uh, were able to get into the cradle and then we'll sort of break down what happened after that. When thinking about Garmin, the first white shark we ever captured, tagged and released, uh, the main feeling I feel of was relief because when we headed out on that trip, there was a lot of fear of the unknown. We didn't know what was going to happen, if it was possible. So this is not a drill. The initial cradle that was on the lift wasn't much bigger than the size of the sharks. The idea of getting one of these animals to go into a cradle that basically fits their same size, uh, they don't just cooperate and choose to do that. So it became that time as how do we create as much margin of error, as much room to just try to get these big animals in there and pick them up. And that really evolved around Garmin and the first shark or two we caught. And to know that we could get that animal in the cradle, even though we had to modify it and change things a lot and really figure out a strategy for capturing them, it was just relief. And then the mind exploded with opportunities to help scientists around the world. But until we captured and released Garmin, we really didn't know if that was possible. So we hear from Chris's perspective what that was like. I want to hear from your perspective what this experience was like for you when you when this is uh, presented to you uh, of this this task of finding and bringing white sharks to scientists? Yeah, um, well, I remember at the time, um, you know, we had been shooting uh, television shows for about eight years or more. Um, we were making a, a show called Offshore Adventures, another one called Ocean Hunter. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of bill fishing and you know, big marlin, big tuna, spear fishing, and, and all kinds of other stuff. Um, I was, you know, when, when Chris asked me to go out there um, in the did I think I could capture one of these things and put it on the lift? Um, it took me about a, a millisecond to say yes. Of course, I didn't. I didn't really question whether we could. Um, I wasn't sure exactly um, how yet. I mean, I, I, had, I had enough background with working with ropes from some commercial fishing and sword fishing, um, enough big game fishing and all the things. I, I knew what I was basically going to do. Um, getting him onto the platform, and I hadn't seen the contraption that Michael Domeyer had made yet. Um, I haven't even met him, I don't think. So um, I can see that the one shark that we had there, it already, it already had buoys on it. So it wasn't our first first attempt. We had one attempt that we hadn't even gotten the um, the buoys on there. That was our first successful one. Um, we had one that we didn't have the buoys close to the shark's face yet. And we were like, how can we get him up onto the lift, um, which was going to be very difficult. Um, the, the idea of having a cradle, you know, when I, I, I was against it from the beginning, 
Um, I know that, you know, scientists throughout the, the years, um, they use cradles and stuff. And, and, and a lot of times because they're working with, um, you know, dolphins and other things that they have these slings for. Um, I've always kind of thought that, it, you know, I, I've seen enough sharks on deck of a boat and they just seem fine. And it lets them wiggle around a little bit on, on and pivot on their belly. I never really understood why people wanted to put them in a, a sling and bend their fins and and get them. And it's, it, it was like threading a needle with the white shark. And it's like, it wasn't going to happen easily. And I think that in order to do it, we probably would have banged the shark up. And so I was always against that method. Um, but the, what, but the scientists, um, they, they, you know, they have a lot of say so and what goes on there. And I'm, I'm there to try to help them, not them helping me. So I was like, okay, well, we'll work with you on this. We'll try your method first, but I see, um, you know, some inherent problems um, that we're going to be facing toward the end, and and it, and, it, and it did, and then and then so when it, it became apparent to them, as I described, it would happen. It did happen, and then they said, "Okay, now can I disassemble your contraption and just put the shark on deck and just make a make a, a wall for him, a corral? It'll be much better for the shark. It'll be much easier for us. It'll be much more doable." Um, that was one of the first things we had to overcome. Um, I'm, I'm curious, Brett, I got a quick question. There were some coming in here, but um, where does your head go when you have a massive problem like that that you have to solve? Like, let's take, and I'm not, not necessarily the first one, but when you have a big problem to, to solve, what are some of the steps that you almost always do in your brain? Well, first of all, I love problem solving. I like that a whole lot better than um, have knowing that being taught, you know, here's what to do. I'd much rather figure it out myself because then I can analyze all the different, I, I've seen enough scenarios in my life, you know, spending a life at sea, I can kind of visualize what's going to happen before it does happen. And I can, uh, you know, make a plan before it happens for all the contingencies. Um, I, so I get excited when there's something like when it was like, okay, we got to get this thing up on a lift. And I, you know, we, I remember after the first night we went up, we had just tried to get one on. We couldn't, it went just under the platform and broke the cable right next to the hook. And it was like, okay, well, the shark's no worse off, but that's still going to be our problem. Um, so sitting there just up in the, the tackle bar and tackle center on the boat and just analyzing everything we have on the boat and brainstorming with uh, other fishermen until we come up with uh, a new method and how we can attach the buoys and stuff. But, um, I find it thrilling to, to figure it out. In fact, my, my brain, um, it works that, like that nonstop. I, I'm not very good at memorizing things. I mean, sometimes I, 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 I relearn things or, or for the first time, two or three times. Because <laughs> like, if I haven't done it for a few years, I was like, I forget how we even did it. But I come up with the exact same method again the second time or the third time even, just because that's how my, uh, you know, the steps that I would take to solve each problem are. And it's kind of funny. Like sometimes I, I better write this down. It's like, Oh, I'll remember it. And then later on, I don't, then I look at how I've solved it the second time. I was like, well, basically the same as the first time. So I really enjoy that part of the job. Thanks. And I only ask because whether you're trying to catch a white shark or you're just trying to solve problems, you know, around the house, like people are confronted with problems every single day. And sometimes they require you to engineer something. So, you know, Getting insight from you is one of the like you one of the best problem solvers I've ever I've ever met. I think we can all learn from from the advice that you have to share when it comes to solving a problem anytime. So anyway, that was just a quick question that I had. To, you, you know, there, there's one thing I can add to that. I, I lived about almost half my life in Mexico. You know, I, I moved to Mexico just after high school, and I lived there for about 21 years, and. There's something about my Mexican friends or or problem solvers because that we have less stuff. I mean, it was like you can go to the store and find almost anything you can up when you're in San Diego fixing your boat. But working on a boat down there, it was like it was amazing to see how people would do with less stuff. You know, and it's like, well, there's something here. Whatever we got around here is going to solve this problem. <laughs> and I always enjoyed that, too. So, oh, yeah, problem solving is fun. And you're very creative with how you problem solve as well. And so this is now a slide that you see of Vimy, one of the last sharks uh, that you tagged and released. And 
So what's changed? We saw Garmin before and Vimy now. What what has changed over these years as far as developing your methods or how you prepared uh, for finding these white sharks? Well, once we got the, you know, we decided that we're going to put them on deck. I went and you can see the, the corral right there, the one with all the, um, the advertisements on it, the blue um, mm -hmm. background. And then it has a railing there, which is, um, it's a pipe railing. And I, I designed that um, to make it easy for us to enter and have the rope slide up over and not catch on anything um, and have there nothing dangerous for me to hang up on or the shark to hang up on. And then I had my friend build it. And then we put it on the platform. And then ever since then, the, the, the method of bringing them in has been much easier. We still had a problem um, getting the sharks. would like They would try to swim outside the platform um, even after we got the buoys next to their face. And I'll describe how we do that in a second. But if we, um, if, if we have the buoys next to their face, it can't dive under the water very far. Um, but it can still swim out to the side and around the platform if it sees it ahead of time. So um, when we were in Africa... Um, I was jumping into the platform and basically pulling the sharks to me. I would walk across to the back end of the platform and pull the sharks right almost to my feet and then climb up out of the way um, to, to safety, um, which in certain situations, getting hit by waves or, or having glare on the water, um, having it be nighttime and dark um, was you know something we needed to do better because eventually you're going to have a shark too close to you. Um, so then I, you know, I, I I uh, made a, a post on the inside of the platform, one on the front, one on the back. So I, so it depends if we're coming in one direction or the other. Sometimes the shark wants to come in from the opposite direction and you have to come in forward to aft um, instead of aft to forward. Um, but I would jump in and I would put the, the rope that I have in my hand over this new post. And then the boat would continue pulling on that rope. Um, much harder than I can, and it would pull it around that post and pull toward the shark toward the inner side of the platform so it can't go around the outside. Um, and that was another big breakthrough. So um, we had to get the, you know, the breakthrough of being able to get the sharks, um, get the buoys next to the shark's face, um, and we did that a couple different ways. Um, when we were using the really big hook um, with chain on it, um, I attached a, a butter knife onto the chain on one side so it was dangling on the lower side next to the hook and it was seized by by wire on the upper side closer to where you know the the hand your, your you know the upper side of the leader um then that way when we got when we got the shark up close to the side of the boat those really big ones are hard to keep there for very long and we wanted a way that we can quickly put the buoys on without endangering ourselves keeping our hands too close to the shark's face for too long so that butter knife um, ended up being a, a really easy way to do it when we had the big hook and the big chain. Um, I would slide the, the, a carabiner onto the line above the, the, the knife. And then as, I, if I, as soon as I could reach it, I would push the carabiner past the knife down toward the hook and then just let go. The, buoy, the, the buoyancy of the, the float would pull it back up and it would toggle on the knife. So I do that. I could do that two or three times, and really, really quick. And my hand would be down there next to the shark's face for only a fraction of a second, um, instead of me trying to um, feel around for putting it in a chain link or a ring. So that was really helpful. Um, and then, so we had uh, a couple things. You know, we, we had now we had them at the surface, and then we had another way to 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 make sure that the shark couldn't swim outside the platform. And those were the main things. And ever since then, our, our method hasn't changed too much. We, we try to get in front of the shark when we, when we hook them. Um, you know, sharks are streamlined. They're made to swim forward. And they have no way of really stopping from going forward. They can't put on, you know, like if you take your dog for a walk and it doesn't want to go for a walk, it puts his feet out and it's stubborn and he says, no, I'm not going. Um, fish can't do that, right? They're just going to go forward. So I, what I do is I get in front of them instead of fighting the, sh the, the fish and having it take off and maybe behind it. And it's like, Oh, he's going on a run. Now I'm pulling him back toward me and he turns and goes on a run. Um, we don't let that happen. We, as soon as we hook him, we get in front of the shark and we start like, it, it's really frustrating for the shark because it, it wants to turn in order to, to go the opposite way. But we would put enough pressure on it from directly in front of it. He has a really hard time turning. And so we do that 
and, to, and for just a few minutes and they get frustrated enough to where they learn. They just go, okay, well, I'm just going to follow the boat. And they end up following the boat usually within just a few minutes. Um, we're putting very little pressure and sometimes we even feed them slack line and they're still following the boat. Um, it, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible how you, you, the, the process, how it's changed over the years. Um, especially in shallow water. I, I talk about this quite a bit is a shark in shallow water can't dive down. So you don't have to worry about him pulling straight down that, that way I can get in front of him. If it was, if I was in deep water, um, I can't get the boat um, in front of him as fast because he can dive straight down. But um, the shallow water makes it really easy. And some of these sharks, we are actually um, reducing our fight time, um, you know, just to a few minutes um, before we have them in semi control and a learned behavior. There's a cut there. Uh, I see some people asking some, some pretty good questions. Um, and really quick, Brett, Megan asked, um, nowadays, mm -hmm. How many ways are there? How many different, uh, how does you say, how many different methods are there for getting the shark into the cradle? There's really, there's really only the one method, right? Or sometimes you may have to adjust it a little bit, but I guess how quickly or how would you answer Megan's question? Yeah, the, the, um, the method has become almost like a recipe built uh, baking a cake at this point. We don't try to vary it too much. Um, we, we know that we also put accelerometers on the line so we can tell how hard the shark is fighting. Um, we can tell how much stress we're putting it under. Um, we don't like to change that too much. Our method is really, um, it's designed around the health of the shark. So we're trying to keep their stress levels very low. Um, and so this method, um, doesn't vary too much. Now, if there was something that went wrong, um, with uh, the shark, let's say it got wrapped up or something like that, and I couldn't unwrap it um, where I was. Maybe we could put it on just by jumping in and pulling it up next to us, but um, that has never happened. So I, that's just a theoretical, hypothetical um, situation. But no, for, for the most part, um, especially on the bigger sharks, um, it's all the same technique. The smaller ones, um, it can be a little different because we can catch them off the back of the boat and kind of just lift them up by the tail and the, in their head. Um, just a couple people because they don't weigh that much. But the big ones, um, it's all the same. So we've, we're hearing about the method too, but there's a lot of preparation that also goes into an expedition and into the method. So would you mind sharing what some of the preparation is that you go through before an expedition begins and maybe in the very, you know, first couple of days that you're fishing? Well, actually, before you forget that, let's take a quick look at this uh, video that may answer some of those questions, and then we'll dive in a little deeper for me. If I haven't been to a spot and I want to just and start looking around for white sharks. I, you know, I typically just look for certain depths of water that I'm that I found them in in the past. When it really comes to the fishing, I, you know, I, I just analyze the charts, all the shoals, the rock, um, however the island is structured, where the currents are coming from, look at the water temperatures, and just get a, gather as much information as I can. If I can try to get in their head a little bit and figure out, okay, well, if they're going to probably be coming down this depth of water, they're not going to want to go up over the top of this shoal. That means they're going to kind of run this shoal line and they're probably going to come to this apex or a pinch point and I'll have my bait right there. Some people think we just chum, chum, chum. You know, on this trip, we're not coming at all. Just placing my baits where I think that they're going to get bit. The idea that people think, you know, go out there and chum a bunch and that's how you can get a bunch of sharks is really not the case. It's always nice when you're looking at a new spot to get success early because you don't know if it's if there's fish there or not. It could be okay. They're, they're here, but I'm, I'm I've got to change my tactics, or they're just not here possibly. Um, so if you go several days without getting any any bites, you know you start second guessing everything you've done. Having success early is a, a big deal for me.
So we, we are hearing things like I know students are learning about in school uh, remotely or in school tides and temperatures and, and currents. And I remember being on the ship when Vimy was tagged, hearing about the slack tide. Would you mind uh, talking a little bit more about the preparation of going into an expedition like this? Sure. Um, yeah, there's, um, there's lots to, to do in preparation for these trips. Um, part of it is just gathering knowledge like I was talking about there. You know, I've got here at my house, I don't know if you can see my computer over there. Um, I've got charts up on it. Um, I'm able to look um, in advance where we're fishing from home. Um, so even if I'm not in the area or on the boat, I can, I can do lots of studying on the details of the charts. Um, and a lot of it has to do with um, getting the ship into a position where we can do our work because it doesn't handle, we can't do um, our work in really rough weather. So we're you know, I'm, part of it. I'm looking for anchorages that also look like they might have um, possibility of catching some sharks there. Um, there's, there's plenty to look at when it comes to um, stuff on the internet. Now I can gather um, certain sites I can go to and I could look at the, uh, the sea surface temperature from satellites. Um, it'll tell me the exact, you know, the exact temperature of the ocean and I can see where the, the current breaks are um, as well. Um, I can see the temperature breaks. I can see, see, see current breaks. I can see the color of the water. Um, I can tell if they're ha, ha, with the plankton content of the water, chlorophyll. I can tell the altimetry of the water, the surface height of the water, whether it's an upwelling or downwelling, which is a big indicator of life in the area. Um, now, most of those things are helpful offshore. They're not all necessarily helpful for when you're white shark fishing for scientists in a region where you have to pick up guests within 15 miles of a port and you need to stay out of the weather. There's so many other factors that I, that you know, so some of the stuff with sea surface temperature and, and all that other stuff is something that would be more useful offshore. Um, but there's plenty there that, that's helpful even inshore, especially when it comes to current. Um, the, the, the preparation, um, and like what I was talking about there on um, looking at contours, you know, sometimes you know that, like, let's say if I'm over off of Cape Cod and I know that there's thousands of seals in on the beach, um, I don't necessarily want to be in on the beach next to them or maybe not even permitted for it, but I can be outside their shoals and stuff. And if I look at it, I'm like, well, there's certain pathways to get there. If they're going to go to the seals, um, there's so much shallow water. I think that they're going to pick the deep water trough to enter and leave. And that's what I was um, referring to in that, you know, it's, it makes it kind of, when you look at a chart for hours and days and you just keep on staring at it, things start becoming more obvious to you. And that's what I do is I just kind of stare at charts for forever and ever and just daydream a little bit. Um, there's also a lot of preparation with tackle. So um, if I'm at home, um, I could make up leaders. A well, leader is um, the cable part of the, uh, of the line, you know, you go from, you start with a hook. Now the hook is, you know, similar to one of these, just a little circle hook. Um, it's designed specifically to get into the corner of the mouth. So it'll go into the corner. It won't hang down deep in the throat because the point of the hook is going that way. So if it was going that way, it could hang and, and damage the gills or the stomach lining. But this kind of hook is designed to come to not hang there until it gets into the corner of the mouth. And then when it tries to come around the corner, it hangs like that. So um, they're really genius design. Um, that way we can guarantee that the hook will be in the corner of the mouth um, and not hurt the shark. From, from the hook, I go up about 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches to, and I put a ring. Um, that ring is there so I can attach those yellow buoys that you see on the, um, that are next to the shark there. They have a, a carabiner um, hey, attached to the buoy. Now um, I can attach the buoys to that ring, and that's what a, that's the part that keeps the shark from diving under the water at the very end. From that ring, I go up another probably another forty feet um, of cable. Um, that way, if the if the shark rolls up um, a few times on the leader, hey, we're having um, a little bit of weather. And then uh, he, he can get his mouth on the rope and he can bite through the rope. So I don't like having a short leader, I like a long leader. Um, I don't like having a long cable leader because it, it's hard to pull on a big, big shark on a cable leader. It's really hard on our hands. Um, sometimes if the shark gets the, the cable around its fins or gets wrapped up for a second, the cable tends to 
leave scars like cut into the shark skin a little bit. I don't like that. I don't want to do any damage to the shark. So what I do is I, that the second part of the leader, the 40 foot length of leader, I embed in a rope. So you can't see the, the, the cable leader. It is actually in the center of a polypropylene three eighths inch rope. Um, that makes it easier for me to grab with my hands and pull up. I can reattach buoys closer and closer to the shark because you can attach a buoy to rope you can't attach it to cable. Um, and it, it, the, the connection thing doesn't clamp on to cable well enough. The um, other part is, that if, so if the shark wraps up, he's got this nice thick rope and it doesn't damage his fins or his gills or anything like that. So we've thought about all kinds of things to try to keep the, the shark safe and, and the job easier for us. And then from there, it goes up to a long, you know, a longer length of rope with some buoys on it. Um, here we got DJ explaining the whole thing and, you can see a visualization right now. If you can get the volume. No, it's playing silently. If you, you can just sort of explain what okay, it is. I'll explain right now. Yeah. Okay, so, so we, we typically right now I'm fishing with what you call a drum line. It's a breakaway drum line. Um, basically, an anchored up buoy. So I just drop an anchor in the water with a buoy on the end of it. And okay, that's where I'm going to fish. Now I take my set of gear. And I, I, I have the hook, the cable leader, some rope, and then I have a series of smaller to larger buoys, um, the larger ones being on the back end. Um, now, th I put those out on the surface, and I put the bait down in the water. And then in the back end of that whole set of gear, I just take a little piece of fishing line, and I tie that from the back end of our fishing line to the anchored up buoy, and then we just leave it there. Now, when the shark comes up and eats the bait, he, the, the first small buoys will set the hook in the corner of its mouth. And then when it feels that, it'll start to swim off. And the monofilament fishing line is such a light line that it breaks right away. And it breaks without too much pressure. The shark barely even feels it. Um, it just, it's just like another, okay, now it knows it's dragging something around. But we'll see the buoys separate from the, the, the fishing buoys separate from the anchored up buoy and you'll see them get further and further apart. And it'll be obvious, Oh, we have a shark on there. It's pulling it away from the buoy. And then at that point we'll, we'll, we'll drive over there, grab the back end of our, our line as it's swimming away. And usually they're swimming away really um, quietly and slowly because of the method. They, we're not pulling on them very hard and they, there's no direction. There's not like a boat to run away from or anything. So they're usually just kind of swimming, meandering along and we come up behind them grab the back end of it, pull our way up to it, put the buoy in the boat, creep up forward, pull the next buoy. And most of the time we can get up fairly close to them before they even realize that we're there. And then we start the process of putting a little more pressure on it, seeing which way it wants to swim, um, letting them take a little run because um, it's probably going to want to take a little run. And then as soon as it does, we'll just kind of follow it at that speed. And then when it settles down, we'll try to figure out which way it wants to swim. Then we'll get in front of it. And then at that point, um, we are starting to dictate the, the, the whole process. It can't really put on the brakes, so that's when we start steering it. We, can, we teach it. It's a learned helplessness. They learn that they're helpless against our method, and then we steer them back to the boat, and that's the process. And I'm excited now, too. You're adding some technology to the gear. You kind of mentioned it before with the accelerometer. What that's what is that telling you, or what's the purpose of having the accelerometer on the gear? Well, an accelerometer, it's, it's a little device um, like you would have inside your cell phone that, that can tell you which way is up. So, you know, when you turn your picture, it stays upright. Um, it just, it, it can feel forces of up and down, side to side, and it records those. So what we do is we, we put them inside a little PVC tube. We attach it to the leader fairly close to the shark. And when the shark bites, you can, well, when, we, when, when we're done with everything, you can take this accelerometer off, back off of the leader, put it into a computer, and you can see what it's recorded. So you'll be able to see when it was just sitting there bobbing in the waves and waiting to, for a shark to come along. And then you'll see when the shark bites, you'll see something happen on the accelerometer. And then when we show up and start pulling on it and the shark starts changing direction and fighting, you'll see all that translated into a graph form. Um, and so we can tell how much, um, energy and the shark's exerting, how fast it's swimming, how the tail beats, you know, how hard the shark is fighting. And 
we, we, we can learn so much. And so part of it is like, you know, a lot of people will think, oh, those, the, those sharks are so enormous. Those people are fighting them for hours and exhausting them. But they say that because they just can't imagine any other way. They don't know that. They just assume it. And so this is a really good way for us to show people that like, this is not just a story of me saying I caught them really fast. This is me having a scientific method and, and a record of saying, here's exactly what happened with that shark. And on some, in some cases, if I'm able to predict the direction the shark is going to swim right after it bites, and I know what speed it's swimming at, I can match its direction and speed, and it barely even know, it knows that I'm in front of it, and I'm just starting to dictate. And I've had, I've had at least one that we couldn't even really say that it was a fight. I mean, he said, well, the fight time was basically zero until you pulled it up to the side of the boat and put the buoys on it. But the, the whole getting it into a lead and steering it back to the boat, the shark never had any real exertion that they, we can tell. So that's my goal is to try to get the fight times down to zero to where I can, by the time we get it back to the boat, the accelerometer data is showing there's very little um, going on with the, with the exertion from the shark and from us. And then when we look at the blood work when we take put them on the deck we an, we, we take blood and then we analyze it um the very first when they first come on and, and then once again right before they they leave so we can look at the blood and try to tell how stressed the shark you know how healthy it is how stressed it was during the process of fighting and how stressed it was during the process of tagging um right before we leave release and we can look at all that stuff and we can tell whether we're doing a good job for the shark if people have, have any questions about you know, are these sharks healthy when they leave or some of them dying or anything like that? We can say, look, we, we have all the data that proves that they're very healthy when they leave and um, that uh, basically we're doing a good job. There have been a couple of, of good questions that have come in here, Brett, um, and maybe you mentioned it, but I missed it. Well, two questions. First, how, how big is the hook that we use? What's the smallest hook we use? What's the biggest hook we use? And then the second is a couple of people have asked, how long does it take to get the shark from once you hooked up back to the cradle, usually? Well, the hook size, what we use right now is um, we use a moose dod. Um, it's a it's a 20 uh 5X circle hook. Um, they don't sell them. They were custom made for us. In the in early days, um, we had a 27 aught hook that, we cut, that moose dod made for us. Um, which was too big for most sharks, but we but when we were tried to go to a, a, the next size smaller on the twenty out three x hook, we were bending and breaking some hooks um, when we were trying to put the shark on onto the platform. So the um, the the, tw the, the twenty seven out hook um, looks huge, um, but it it um, when you put it in a really really large shark, it, it, it looked just right. But we can't we would never be able to fish that hook without actually seeing how big the shark was first and, and putting it in the water. Um, so Almost all the sharks we caught in the early days, we hooked at boat. Um, I never put a, a bait down. Since then, we've had Mustad make a 20 out 5X hook for us, which is just about like this. This is It's one size larger than this one. Um, it's about the size of my palm. And with that one, I'm comfortable with putting it a, a bait in the water without having seen the shark first because I know a smaller shark comes up, it's not going to be damaged by the hook size. But if a bigger shark comes up, it's still strong enough to be able to put them on the platform. So it was, it took a while to get that hook size just right. I know that sometimes I, it's, a, I hate to look at the larger um, hook that we were using in the early days, but it was just what we had to go with. And then the second question, just real quick, how, cause a couple of people have asked now, or if you've already mentioned, just, just remind us, how long does it usually take from the time you hook up to the time you get back to the cradle? Well, that all depends on how close we are to the boat. Um, I, you know, the the one thing that makes our job, well, one thing that makes it even more difficult to catch sharks is that we have to fish really close to the mothership. The mothership has to be in basically in flat water in order to use the platform. So that might be behind an island. That might be just inside a peninsula. It's very rarely offshore um, that we have good enough weather to be able to do our research off there. So. That being said, um, I might not think that there's a good spot for fish within a few miles of the boat um, where it is out of the weather. Sometimes we get in a spot where you can you can catch sharks right next to the boat. Sometimes it's like we're not in a very good spot for this, and I have to go a little further from the boat. 
about a, I don't usually like to stretch it out more than three miles from the boat because at, at basically at the, the traveling speed that will walk the shark back to the boat is going to be about 3.5 knots on average, um, depending on the size of the shark. And then if there's current in our face, it's going to slow us down. But that'll take us an hour to get back to the boat if we're three miles away. So I don't like to have to do that. I, I prefer to catch the sharks right next to the boat. If I'm able to catch the sharks right next to the boat and have them in control within 10 minutes or so, and the platform is already coming down, we can go right on. Um, so it can be up and onto the deck um, you know, in 20 minutes or less if we're, if we're right there. It don't, it's just, it basically, it's, it, it's just how far from the boat that I'm fishing on the contender. Lindsay, did you have an, uh, an activity for us? Yeah, I, I do, but I had one more thing I wanted to make sure that we covered too, because we talked about the gear, which I love hearing about, but you have another role too. Once the shark comes to the lift, you're a caretaker for that shark as well. So you, would you mind touching on that and talking about what you do and what your role is once it's on deck? Yeah, so, you know, in the beginning part, it's going to take a little bit of just straight up fishing, but I'm more caretakers from the very beginning too. I mean, let's face it, this, the whole method is, is designed to take care of them. So, um, but yeah, as soon as we get the shark up and on to the deck, once I've leapt into the water and put the, the rope over the post and had the, the shark pulled around the post and into the platform, I'm out of the way for that time. I, I'm on the other side of the wall. And as he comes over the platform, I lift the rope off the post so the, the, the boat can continue pulling him toward the far end of the, the front end to the platform. At that point, the nose of the shark kind of gets stuck up in the corner between the far gate and the side wall, um, which isn't good for getting access to the shark. I won't be able to get the hose in his mouth and we wouldn't have um, enough space for the scientists to work on both sides of the shark while we're tagging him and, and doing all the other work. So before we um, lift the shark up and onto a dry deck, um, I'll step back into the corral, grab the shark by the tail, and pull him backwards toward the center of the platform. As soon as I got the shark in the center of the platform or close to the center, I, I take the tail and I put pressure on it to, to turn him over. So I push sideways on the upper lobe of the tail and the opposite way on the, on the lower lobe of the tail, and I just put a lot of pressure and and uh, I just hold it there for a second and the shark will try to fight it. It doesn't want to roll over, but they have a tendency to be kind of led by their tail if you put enough pressure on them. Um, so it, it fights one direction for a second and then I feel it as it's starting to give and come back the other way and I put even more pressure and I'm able to, to even a big shark, I'm able to usually roll them on their back or side um, just by their tail. And then once I have done that and he's in the center, um, we'll say up and they lift the, the platform up as soon as the shark's out of the water, now it can't move. It can't flop on one side of the deck or the other very easily, not the big ones anyway. And then I'll walk up um, forward of the shark's face. Somebody will pass me a hose, um, a one and a, um, one and a half inch um, inside diameter hose. It's about this big around um, with a PVC end on it and a little angle on the 45 degree angle on that. So I'll, I'll put up, I'll wait for the, the shark's mouth to open enough to I'll shove it in there real quick. And then I'll just try to get the water flushing up over the gills. Um, as soon as I'm able to do that, um, uh, we also have somebody throw me a towel. Um, and I'll cover the shark's eyes so now it can't really see everything else that's going on around it. Um, there's other animals you do this with um, that you might be familiar. It might make sense. Um, you see people do blinders on horses and you see people covering their eyes of their parrots and their birds and stuff, or even covering their cage to calm them down. So the, 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 the towel covering their eyes, a dark, heavy, wet towel covers their eyes, darkens it out. That's, that's a stress reliever for them. It calms them down. The water rushing over their gills, that makes them you know less stressed. They're getting their oxygen again. Um, and at that point, um, you know, we get a, a tail rope on the shark, and I monitor the front end um, while um, DJ or Max will be monitoring the back end, the tail, and then we'll invite the scientists to come on in, and they'll start um, their procedures um, one after the other, like a pit crew, while we monitor the health of the shark. Well, with that, I think we should go ahead and thank you for explaining that, and let's dive into this activity, because you're not just giving back 
to the science community. You've also given back a lot to the STEM program at OSEARCH. And this is an activity uh, that you helped develop and was inspired by what you do. And your method of thinking, we talked about thinking critically and, and creatively when uh, faced with problems, which we all do in different ways every day. And so this is engineering like a fishing master. And uh, so earlier you mentioned the poly rope and that's one of the scenarios in this activity when 